Good morning. Welcome to Informa's webinar on how real-world evidence is playing out in the real world. Uh, thanks for joining us this morning. Um, my name is Mary Jo Laffler. I head the U.S. commercial and R&D news team for Informa Pharma Intelligence. Uh, just a couple notes before we start. Um, all registrants will receive a copy of the slides and a recording of the presentation as soon as they're available. If you have any questions during the discussion, you can enter them in the Ask a Question box on, under, underneath the media panel. Uh, we'll be monitoring the queue and can take what we can during the Q&A, um, and we will follow up on any questions we don't get to today. So um, I'd like to ask the rest of the panel to uh, introduce themselves. Um, I am Brid Bridget Silverman. I'm the managing editor for U.S. Regulatory Analysis at the Pink Sheet. I am uh, Ben Gutierrez. I head up um, our U.S. Value and Evidence Outcomes team at, at GlaxoSmithKline. I've had uh, 20 years of experience in this area, both in the U.S. organization and in, within R&D. Hi, everyone. Patrice Arpilla. I'm uh, the head of the global epidemiology team at Merck uh, in Darmstadt, Germany. I'm a medical doctor specialist in public health and epidemiology in the industry for a bit more than 15 years now in different positions, several companies, but uh, uh, always dealing with epidemiological or real-world data and non-interventional studies in order to bring uh, actionable real-world evidence into research, market access, and life cycle product management. Great, thank you. Um, I'd like to thank our speakers for joining us today. Um, certainly, real-world evidence has become a very hot topic for industry uh, and really affects multiple areas from um, development to registration to the market. Uh, it's taken on um, increasing importance, uh, strategic importance to the pharmaceutical industry uh, in recent years, uh, spurred on by technological advances uh, that op the opportunities for its application keep expanding too, um, from showing real world outcomes to prove a medicine's value to payers, uh, to better pharmacovigilance, to better demonstrating clinical effects, uh, to even supporting efficacy claims with regulatory agencies. It has the potential to unlock greater efficiency and a more accurate dem demonstration of uh, drug effect and, and value. But it's still a young field, and there's a lot of learning to do. There are concerns about it being less scientific than traditional randomized controlled trials, uh, that the data can be sliced and diced with ease to find desired results, and that there can be inconsistency in methodology. Today, we're going to go through the latest thinking from the US FDA, including the recently released um, framework uh, for real world evidence um, and what it means for industry and uh, look at what we can learn from uh, Pink Sheet's review of drug approvals that have successfully used real-world evidence. Uh, ben and Patrice will help give us perspective on how industry is adopting real-world evidence um, and their experience with incorporating it into clinical and commercial strategy. Um, and, as, and then we'll, we'll go into a Q&A um, as our time permits. Uh, we, sorry, wrong way. Um, as we get started, we wanted to set up some of the terms we'll be using. Uh, so there's both real world data, um, which is that relating to uh, patient health status or um, delivery of healthcare that is collected from a variety of sources. Uh, some of those sources can include electronic health records, um, claims data, uh, disease registries, um, you see some examples there. And then real world evidence is um, the clinical evidence about the usage and potential benefits or risks of a medical product uh, derived from analysis of real world data. Uh, using FDA's um, framework for, for their real world evidence program, um, uh, we wanted to pull out the definitions of some of the types of real world trials as well. Um, so observational studies include, uh, these are non-interventional clinical study designs, um, 
they can be both retrospective or prospective, which have uh, some different concerns um, for FDA in particular, uh, as well as pragmatic trials, which are clinical study designs um, that are intended to mimic routine clinical practice. And another term you'll hear a lot are historical controls, um, which is when you're using data generated um, from outside the study uh, to use that as a comparator for your, uh, your new analysis. Um, so, uh, you know, application and adoption of real world evidence has been a learning process uh, for industry and FDA together with lots of collaboration and experimentation. Uh, it's still very much a work in progress, as the recent framework shows. Um, Bridget, can you walk us through FDA's latest thinking on real-world evidence? Sure. Uh, if we can go to the uh, framework slide. The uh, FDA has been working towards a, um, a 21, 21 guidance on real-world evidence to support efficacy claims, uh, which is a mandate of the 21st Century Cures Act. And uh, this has been a very um, iterative process uh, with, with a lot of, of stakeholder engagement. And uh, FDA in early December came out with its framework for real world, its real-world evidence program which uh, is a document that uh, shows that FDA is very open to the possibilities of real world evidence, but that the agency still has questions, many, many questions. Um, and uh, I, we suspect that they are also getting many, many answers and comments. Um, and uh, actually, they just announced that they were extending the deadline for uh, comments on the framework. Um, so uh, more, more to come there. But if we look at the framework, and um, you know, it, uh, it it starts out by identifying the key factors that are important to determining um, when you can use uh, real world evidence. Um, and one of the the major challenges that uh, lots and lots of people are are addressing is the question of whether real world data are fit for use. Um, then uh, you need to ask, does the study design that is generating the real world evidence using real world data, can that provide adequate evidence to answer the regulatory question? Um, and then you need to uh, obviously address if the study meets FDA's requirements for clinical trials themselves. Um, and uh, FDA has discussed a number of different types and I'd like to actually go ahead here to um, a different slide uh, to look at. FDA is uh, talks is is, is uh, interested in um, pragmatic trials, uh, which are ones that we haven't really seen a whole lot of um, experience with in regulatory decision making yet. Um, but these are some of the key considerations for pragmatic trials that uh, the framework poses. Um, the framework also spends a lot of time talking about observational studies, um, and in particular, retrospective observational studies, which is where a lot of the actual experience that FDA has had so far comes from. So these are some of the key considerations for retrospective observational studies that is posed by the framework. And um, the agency is going to be giving a lot more guidance on these topics. They have, these are just some of the planned guidances. But if we go back to looking at what FDA, real world efficacy in FDA's ef efficacy decisions to date, um, we see that uh, FDA actually has, has relied on real world evidence largely from um, historical controls and uh, universally in um, very rare disease settings. Um, often in cases where there are additional problems um, to patient recruitment that, um, so, so FDA has really, it's been a case of real world evidence has been a, something that's been a response to exigency more than a choice. Um, so uh, if you look at where these, some of these uh, decisions have been, you see that there's a lot of um, natural history cohorts, 
uh, matching um, retrospective case studies, retrospective chart reviews. Um, but what I think is really marks an inflection point are the the uh, approvals of Amgen's Blincito and uh, Merck KGAA, EMD Serono, and Pfizer's Vivencio, which are cases where while they were approved with real world evidence for orphan indications, these are not orphan drugs. Um, and this is a setting where I think, you know, you can really see a chance to, for FDA to get much more comfortable with real world evidence. Um, one of the important ways that is, is that these have been accelerated approvals. So there is a confirmatory trial. Um, and in the case of Blincido, their tower trial did uh, confirm the uh, accelerated approval analysis that had been based on matched historical control data and a model based projection. Um, and, uh, you know, sort of providing again, this, this just a case where uh, it was, it was validated. Um, and uh, why Amgen and had to use real-world evidence um, for this indication is is actually kind of interesting. Um, they were going for an indication in uh, ALL where um, pretty much all of the patients that they were looking at had already failed the standard of care, but FDA still needed a benchmark um, for you know, to, to, to say this is, this, this response rate will be in, will show efficacy. Um, and you see that this, this, this need for benchmarking is a, is a key theme in all of the uh, efficacy decisions that have incorporated real world evidence. Um, it's often cases where there is data showing, you know, suggesting um, a real positive effect, but FDA just needs to know that that's real. Um, so uh, we can then look ahead here to sort of what's coming next. Um, sorry, this is actually going back. Is as this discussion has been going on um, about, uh, you know, getting to the point where real world evidence could actually support uh, new indications for approved products. In the meantime, we're seeing a lot of incremental regulatory steps, and we're seeing that FDA is increasingly open to incorporating real world evidence into its uh, to sponsors incorporating RWE in their clinical development programs in ways that maybe not are directly as a comparator arm for the pivotal efficacy assessment, but that are very important to determining the risk benefit ratio of the drug. Um, you're seeing, you know, obviously safety is the area where real world evidence has the most uh, experience and track record, um, but we're seeing it, you know, being used uh, much more um, prospectively. Uh, and if you look at the case of Shire's um, Motegrity, it was a drug where there was a really significant uh, concern about a class uh, safety risk. So the company proposed that they would do a retrospective cohort study of, to find the relative incidence of major cardiovascular events um, between procalipride patients and uh, matched comparators from the European marketing experience. Um, and they actually are pulling from five different European data sources, um, a lot of sort of very interesting country level uh, data collection there. Um, but, you know, this is a case where, you know, Motegrity's efficacy is not really in question. What's in question for FDA is whether the risk benefit uh, falls on the side of approval. Um, and you could really see that the ability to do this kind of a retrospective cohort study uh, provides that additional confidence. Um, we're also increasingly seeing companies uh, talking about using real world evidence based strategies to support new or different outcome measures in clinical trials. Um, it's a company uh, called Biohaven that does uh, neurology orphan diseases. Um, they've got a, a Tro-Ryuzala drug, where they did a trial, a, a phase two, three trial, 
uh, it, it, it looked good, it was, um, but it didn't meet the endpoints. And then when they went back and did a post hoc analysis, they decided that one of the reasons that the trial had failed was that the, uh, the, the scale that they were using um, was, had, had, had some issues that they wanted to modify and they thought that they could do a better job. So in order to support the modification of the scale, they used uh, real world evidence by um, applying the modified scale to a natural history reference cohort to, uh, and then, which, which did help to convince FDA and they are indeed going ahead with another phase three trial using this modified scale. Um, Bluebird Bio is another example here. Uh, they've got a Lenta D uh, gene therapy for a uh, very rare disease, CALD, um, and uh, their pivotal trial will, uh, all the patients will be receiving the gene therapy, um, and then their responses will be compared against a clinically meaningful benchmark that was based on a retrospective natural history analysis. So again, you see this importance of benchmarking. Um, and then the safety analysis will also, uh, is, is, is going to use real world evidence quite extensively um, because it will be comparing the patients in the trial with both uh, a prospective and a retrospective observational study because they didn't feel that they could have uh, the, the standard um, safety data uh, set for, for that drug. Um, so these are just, and you know, we've got several more examples that are coming up in a, an article in the pink sheet, um, but that FDA is, is definitely open to creative and flexible use of real world evidence uh, in ways that might fall short of the 21st century cures vision, but are nonetheless very important and crucially providing experience for both the agency and sponsors in addressing this new type of evidence. And Mary Jo, I'm gonna hand it back to you. All right, thanks. Um, I think, uh, you know, it's great to have all of those regulatory um, examples. And as Bridget noted, some of them have, um, will be appearing in more detail in the pink sheet. Uh, and again, to um, let everyone know that you will be receiving a copy of these slides. Um, and I uh, can click through to some of the articles that we've done on them. Um, as I do know, the pink sheet has done a great job uh, going through the details of a lot of those early examples. Um, but we also wanted to uh, get some examples of actual clinical trial designs um, from our industry experts. Uh, so um, moving on to those, uh, Patrice, do you wanna walk us through your example? Yes, sure. So that's uh, an example of, uh, sorry, this one. The example of uh, um, one anti cancer drug, so Adalumab or Bazinshu. And uh, this is uh, definitely an example of an external control study. Uh, to support uh, the clinical development. And uh, um, you may have heard just before the historical control, but I think that more and more people are talking now about not so much historical control, but more external control, even uh, regulators, because I, I think that they are right in the sense that uh, uh, they are not so much interested in historical control, meaning what happened several years before, specifically in oncology, where it's a domain where Things are moving very quickly, but more uh, control which are who are as much as possible contemporaneous of uh, the clinical trial setting. So, uh, looking at what happens currently in in, in this uh, real world situation, and and here typically we are in a setting which is very specific because we are talking about Merkel cell carcinoma (MCC), which is a, a rare and very aggressive skin cancer uh, that occurs most frequently, I would say, in elderly and uh, immunocompromised patients. Uh, we had estimated, based on the literature review, that there were approximately 1,500 cases of MCC per year in the USA, uh, and the incidence has uh, dramatically in increased over the last 20 years, unfortunately. The point is that it's also a very 
um, aggressive disease, so with a relatively poor prognosis. And uh, among the patients which are diagnosed uh, with local or regional disease, uh, uh, what we re I remember was that the reported rates of recurrence was most of the time around 50%, and the five-year overall survival was uh, around 40%. Uh, so quite high mortality, even higher than other skin cancer. And in this setting, unfortunately, the response to a traditional chemotherapy in metastatic disease were often not durable, uh, with very low uh, overall response rate and then overall survival. So given the rarity of the disease and the poor prognostic also for this patient with uh, stage 4, so metastatic disease, which were our, the target population, it was very challenging to perform randomized head-to-head -head clinical trials comparing chemotherapy uh, with our PDL1, PD1 immunotherapy. And this is why indeed uh, to uh, properly contextualize and interpret the outcome of uh, the single harm trial that we were doing, uh, we have decided to build this uh, cohort in a retrospective database. To answer the question that fit also the primary objective of the singular harm trial, which was what is the progressive, the, the progression free survival in metastatic MCC second line patient. And once again, I like the way you, you phrase it uh, before. It, it was really to benchmark uh, the results of the clinical trial with this results of the real life more than comparing because we were in a very small we, uh, population and you will see in the graph. Uh, below that uh, we ended with only 14 patients in real life, even if we use a large uh, electronic health record data set um, provided by McKinson Specialty Health. Uh, so we had established a collaboration with them in order to do this study. So you see on the left side, indeed, that's the results of this uh, uh, analysis in the real life setting where we were able to show that the median progression free survival was around 4.6 months. And I put in, in, uh, on the right side, in fact, the results of the clinical trial. And you can see that if we limit, uh, as uh, you see it, uh, to the period of five months, then it's more or less where you have no more patients, uh, in the real life, meaning that they have, uh, all uh, progressed, uh, which was not the case at all in the clinical trial. So I think these results were quite instrumental indeed during the approval process in the US. Um, I think that does make a really sort of striking striking effect of, of how you can um, you know, turn around those outcomes uh, so dramatically. Um, can if I ask I if... Just, if yeah, sorry, just to add something that is also key, uh, specifically when we are dealing with real world data, I think uh, this was definitely, and I should have mentioned this before, not the only one study to support this. So we did exactly the same thing in a German uh, registry and uh, confirming the same uh, similar results in addition to a literature review uh, showing uh, what has been published before. So this was a package, I would say, and not just a, a one study. Right, so you're, you're making sure you're doing that confirmation then and, and looking in other settings, um, uh, not disease settings, but in other countries to uh, to replicate that. Um, and I, I think like you're saying it's, it is uh, quite striking that sort of being able to use uh, this external control as a, as a way to, um, to measure this effect and, and to show what the drug can do in this setting um, is, a, is a great example of, of Applying real world evidence collection um, is is that something that you guys are trying to um, to replicate? What are your learnings from um, from your experience with with the Pavencio and MCC example? Yes, so the definitely. Uh, I think when it fits the purpose. So uh, just before we hear that fit for use, and I'm used to say that indeed uh, we are doing this kind of studies when it fit for the purpose of, of the research question, and depending on the setting of the disease we're interested in. But it's true that uh, uh, in rare diseases where uh, when like it's written there, there is no evidence based on that of care. It's very challenging to find the right comparator. And in oncology specifically, well, when you're going in, in um, 
this kind of uh, very aggressive skin cancer, or even sometimes when uh, you are looking at specific subgroups within a larger sets of cancer, uh, but when dealing with a specific mutation, uh, like in lung cancer, this is a kind of uh, support that you can bring to the clinical development. But for this, Great. you need to find the right data with uh, the right, I will say, uh, assessment of the outcomes, the right biomarker information uh, to identify your population and so on. So there are also lots of conditions that need to be fulfilled for this. Thanks, I think that's uh, extremely useful. Um, uh, and turning to Ben, I know you selected uh, GSK's Salford study, um, which has been one of the most ambitious rare world trials to date. Uh, do you want to walk us through that? Sure. So I'm going to um, tell you about the Salford lung study. Um, I'm going to start off with a little bit of background and then uh, talk about the study. Um, so at the time we initiated this study, we had uh, a number of new respiratory medicines we were launching, and the Salford Lung Study looks at a medicine that's called Brio in the U.S. It's called Relvar in Europe, and it's a new um, inhaled corticosteroid, long-acting uh, beta agonist uh, dual therapy. Uh, what was unique about it was a new device, new molecules, um, hopefully leading to better outcomes. But we recognized early on that... Um, it may be difficult to show those better outcomes uh, in a traditional clinical trial. Uh, we wanted to, to uh, demonstrate that in a real-world setting, and we thought um, European HTAs and payers would be asking for this evidence, so we, we planned this study. Um, prior to uh, getting the drug approved. So, so we think that this is the first pragmatic clinical trial initiated before the medicine is actually approved uh, and available in the marketplace. Um, so that's sort of the background. And then um, in terms of the study, we, we were, um, you know, it's a pragmatic clinical trial, so we randomized patients to, um, to RELVAR and then to usual care. Um, we evaluated patients over 12 months, and the goal was to um, run it as a clinical trial because of uh, the need for some monitoring, and it, it was pre, you know, pre-approval, so we needed to ensure safety. Um, appropriate safety monitoring, but uh, make it as real world as possible. So some of the challenges we had to overcome were uh, around making sure all the um, all the the clinical information systems, um, you know, for the Salford uh, area were we were able to link them all, um, and so there was a bit of work around infrastructure. Um, we had to evaluate the quality of the data. The, the primary endpoint here is a, is a questionnaire. It's the asthma control test. So we did have to build in a data capture that wasn't in the, the EHRs. And the other thing I would like to point out is this is open label, which you would expect given it's a real-world evidence study, but that presented some challenges uh, later on. Um, so um, ran this study over a couple of years. We've gotten the results. We show... Um, we show some positive uh, data here that we've presented to a number of HTAs and pairs around the world. I think HTAs and pairs um, recognize the, the complexity of running the study and, and, and are um, using the, the results in terms of evaluating our medicine. Um, but we're still talking to regulators about um, sort of uh, the acceptance of this data. And, and the one thing I'll point out again, given it's open label, there's some challenges with an open label study where you've got a, a subjective endpoint you know, a, a, an endpoint that the patient's reporting uh, as a result of the study. Um, so that's some of, of, of what we had to deal with there. I think in terms of some of the learnings um, that we're using for future studies, um, there's a bit of work to understand the, the, uh, the data you're accessing, the quality of the data, um, and, and uh, the ability to run these studies very efficiently so that you can you can read them out more quickly. This one took a bit longer than we expected. Um, and I think the other thing that I think is important to consider is um, how will, will the, the results be, be accepted by the different audiences. This was a, a focus on HTAs and payers, and I think we, we met that objective. But then if you want to have a broader application with reg regulatory bodies, um, have you had a you know, discussion early on about the acceptability of this evidence given the design and the, and the capture of information in terms of using it for, um, for other, other applications. 
Well, thanks, Ben. Um, could you tell us a bit about sort of the reception you've had with uh, HTA agencies and, and payers, uh, their, their reception of the Salford data? I think in general, um, it's been well received. Um, they, they understand the complexity of running a study like this. As you can see on the slide, it's, it's had four, over 4,000 patients. Um, we were tapping into the EHRs, we were linking to pharmacy records, um, and we were trying to make it as real world as possible. And then we, we found uh, uh, superiority on, on the asthma control test, so an improvement in, in uh, asthma symptoms. Um, so I think they, they've been very receptive. It, it helps inform the thinking about the value of the medicine versus uh, available uh, therapies in, 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 uh, for treatment in asthma. Um, uh, and so we've, uh, we've used it in the U.S. as well. Uh, so I think, I think there's, there's a great reception of the data and, and an understanding that, that this is difficult to do, but also an expectation that we should be doing more of these. And that's sort of the, the next step for us in terms of figuring out how to do more pragmatic clinical trials or, or just more real-world evidence studies to demonstrate the value of the medicine. So typically we were demonstrating the value of the medicine, uh, looking at efficacy and safety in clinical trials. Then the next step is do we, do we see the same benefit, do we see a, a better benefit in the real world? And, and certainly in the U.S. we're hearing more about that from payers. And I think also in Europe, depending on the competitive environment, that's also an important element in terms of evaluating a, a medicine. Great, thanks. Um, I think uh, having these examples gives a, a sort of a great framework we can use as we talk about some of the um, real world implications of, of real world evidence. Um, I'd like to remind um, everyone that if you have any questions about any of the examples we've gone through, or anything else you'd like um, the panel to discuss, you can use the uh, ask a question box um, below your media player and uh, we'll take a look at those. Um, we'll be monitoring the queue um, and fit those in. Uh, and um, I'm gonna get things going with uh, just a sort of general question um, to Ben and Patrice. Uh, and I know we're, we'll just have some um, examples of, of our uh, relevant coverage uh, scrolling through as as we talk. Um, let's just highlight some of the issues that we've been looking at. But um, Ben and Patrice, we've we've seen how FDA is defining real world evidence. Um, curious, uh, you know, how you guys um, approach those definitions and how you work with real world evidence and data in your roles. Shall I start? <laughs> yeah. This is so it, go ahead, Ben. Well, so um, the, those definitions you have, I think, are consistent with how we think about real-world evidence. Um, um, I think the challenge is uh, trying to uh, understand what research question you're trying to answer. Um, is it a regulatory sort of uh, requirement? Is it something for payers? Is it, is it uh, some other questions you're trying to answer? And then what's the right research design? What's the appropriate data? And um, and will it be robust enough to um, you know to have an impact with with the right decision maker? And so I think that's uh, that's where we're working towards trying to understand where does real world evidence really fit in, um, and tr and trying to uh, answer questions about effectiveness, safety, or um, value. And, and if I may, I will say that sometimes it may also not fit with the research question. So uh, uh, it's not always the solution. And some, you can also say at the end that a randomized clinical trial may be the best option to answer the research question that uh, you have to face. But, but I think the scope of real world data anyway are more and more large. And uh, there is a range of applicability of real world data, which is larger and larger, definitely, and also better accepted nowadays by uh, uh, both regulators and payers. Great, thanks. I sort of curious, uh, going along with the rise in, in real world evidence, um, what you guys think has caused that? Is it sort of helped by uh, developments with technology? Um, is there just more demand? So I think it's it's a combination of things. I think there's um, 
some of its um, the emergence of, as, let's say, the U.S. In the U.S., I think, with the advent of uh, electronic health records being broadly used, um, there's, the, you know, we we go beyond administrative claims data to EHRs, and so there's there's just more data available, and then technology available to process the data is has advanced quite a bit. Um, so that's one one aspect that I think has increased over the last couple of years. But I think the other aspect we're seeing, in, at least in the U.S., is that there's more demand for this data. And, and it's, again, about answering a question that can't be answered in the clinical trials. Clinical trials are for answering efficacy and safety. Then, um, given the, the competitive pressures, given the pricing of products, there's a need to answer the question around what is the real-world experience you know, with this product, um, is it delivering the the benefit that we saw in the clinical trial? And we're hearing that more and more from U.S. payers on, on an increasing basis, and there's an expectation that we're going to bring that evidence to them, you know, a few years after launch when that evidence is, you know, the data is accumulated. But there is that demand, and I think that's another opportunity to sort of reevaluate from a payer standpoint, you know, the value of that medicine to to patients. Something that you have also to understand is it's not something new. Uh, as I said in my introduction, I'm in the industry for more than 15 years now, always dealing with real world data. But I think the, the scope has switched a little bit because definitely I think at least from a regulatory perspective, uh, regulators are used to work with real world data specifically for the safety to, to further assess the safety of the drugs once they are marketed and confirm that indeed the, the safety is fine and I would say now more the benefit risk profile of the drug is fine. So what we see is that indeed they are focusing more and more on the effectiveness, so the efficacy in a real world setting. Now in addition to the safety as they did for several years before. But what we see also more and more uh, in terms of regulatory aspects is the need of real world data as just the example of Paventio that I have shown you uh, in for for before the approval, meaning to support the development and support the the, the, the submission. Uh, and I guess that it's also something that the payers and the, the health technology assessment bodies are, are looking more and more to this because it's not just the end once the product is in the market, but you need to further continue to monitor it. And right. So maybe Patrice hmm? I said. So, so I I agree with Patrice. You know, in our area, we, you know, um, this is not new. But what is new, I think, is that um, now the FDA yeah. and other regulatory bodies are, are are thinking about the application of real world evidence for a potential new indication. For um, um, for expanded indications, and 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 that's going to take some time. Um, we, we recognize that they're looking at the quality of the data. They're looking at perhaps the lack of randomization in, in, with observational studies. Um, and I think there again, it's about uh, is there a more efficient way to get medicines to patients, and is real world evidence uh, an opportunity? Once we've established that a product is safe and efficacious. Do we need to do clinical trials for every indication? Or given the use of the product, is there real-world evidence that can support, you know, some expansion of indications or new indications? So I think that's new, and, and the FDA is working through what, what would be required there. And so now there's a lot of uh, attention around the quality of the data, which, you know, was not collected for research purposes, collected, mm -hmm. in, in, you know, as a result of healthcare in, interactions. Um, and then some of the methodological issues that you might have if you're not randomizing. Interesting. Um, I think now you've both sort of alluded to sort of both working with regulators as well as with the payer community um, with collecting this type of data. So maybe picking up on that, um, what if you guys could talk about what has been your experience with payers? Um, are they requesting? Real world evidence, uh, or are you approaching them with it? Um, and what type of data do payers want to see? So, so I can speak for um, the U.S. experience. Uh, we've we actively approach payers uh, with real world evidence for all our products. Um, the nature of the of the question we're answering may be slightly different depending on the product, but we're actively approaching them. Um, 
and uh, and that we're engaging, you know, around uh, what we're finding and uh, and having a clear message about the, yeah. the real world experience with our products. Um, and what we're finding is that it's it's something that uh, payers are, are 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 reviewing and evaluating, um, and they're asking for um, more and more. So I think that's that's a given in the U.S. Um, and, uh, and and we expect to see more of that. Now, now the one thing I'll say, I was recently I had a discussion with a number of payers. What what's also changing a bit in terms of their interest in real world evidence is um, uh, the types of studies. Uh, how big they are and uh, how sort of uh, more robust they are um, is clearly aligned to what kind of decision they need to make. So, for instance, uh, if you're in a competitive space and um, you're trying to demonstrate your product is, you know, is valuable, maybe it's similar, maybe slightly different, th that hurdle might be a bit smaller. But if you want them to make a big decision about changing, um, you know, um, Guidelines or recommendations, or or just just a bigger decision, then they're expecting uh, a more robust study. So they may expect a pragmatic clinical trial or a or a trial where you've uh, made a prospective observational study with a few thousand patients. Uh, and so so that's been clearly articulated more recently that the the expectations will be much higher depending on the the um, the type of decision you want them to make. Thanks. That's a useful perspective. Um, you know, Patrice, you've mentioned the HCA role as well. Um, you know, and in, in especially important in Europe. Um, how accepting are those bodies of real world evidence? So I would say the complexity is uh, mainly in Europe is that there is not one unified HD body like we have the European Medicine Agency. So that's a little bit more challenging because uh, we have uh, 27 European countries or even more if we uh, include the one which are not within the European Union, uh, which means that there are possibly uh, as much as different views on this. Uh, hopefully there are countries which are very... Uh, uh, keen to accept and are demanding anyway real world data to uh, to assess the products uh, or to reassess the products once it's the market for quite some time, and there are others I would say which are focusing mainly on randomized clinical trial for the reason which are always the same when we deal with real world data. It's a little bit linked to the lack of trust about the results because of the lack of randomization and the risk of biases, uh, which I think are not always correct because uh, something that we didn't say maybe before about the increased uh, need for real-world data and interest in real-world data is that also the methodologies have improved quite substantially over the last years to take into account these possible limitations that uh, we have to face with real-world data, knowing that we are in the real life, which means that it's not perfect and that indeed there are some risks, that uh, there are factors that may influence the results. And for this, we have also methodologies now that we can apply to take this potential difference into account and minimize this risk. So that's why also possibly there are uh, countries where this methodology uh, developments are more advanced and then they are more interested in seeing how this can be applied to real world data and accept data coming from the real world uh, compared to others. Uh, do you need different types of data for payers versus regulators? You're sort of talking about some of the quality issues and, and controlling for uh, to be sure you're, you're doing the right assessments. Um, are there different sort of requests coming from the different uh, stakeholders? So I would say for Europe, it's it maybe yes and no. Uh, I, I would say they are looking possibly at different things, the regulators and the payers. Uh, but what's important is that uh, what we have in Europe since few years now is the possibility to have a joint assessment or a joint uh, scientific advisory committee uh, discussion uh, between the European Medicine Agency and the HTA bodies or representatives of HTA bodies in Europe. So uh, the objective there is definitely to try to to fit uh, both kinds of demands, meaning that 
you have to satisfy indeed what will uh, be accepted and uh, needed for regulatory purpose, but you can also sometimes add additional elements or questions uh, that will also fit the needs of the HTAs. So that's something that is developing more and more. I think one um, thing that we're starting to sort of see from from the FDA, FDA is very interested in, you know, when is real world evidence something that you can trust? Um, and I uh, recently spoke with um, Nancy Dreyer, who's the uh, sort of head real world evidence honcho at Achivia. Um And she was really emphasizing that we need to be careful that we're not looking at real world evidence and demanding the same sort of quality and asking the same sort of questions of it as we would a randomized clinical trial. Um, and, you know, then you, you look at um, somebody like uh, Bob, I think it was Bob Temple who, who stood up at uh, one of the real world evidence meetings and said, I don't want to preside over the death of the clinical trial. Um, that uh, these are all, um, uh, that that this is 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 an area where we need to be very careful about um, making sure that we're not asking data to do what the data really isn't best suited to do. That's a great reminder. Um, thank you. Uh, you know, just sort of sticking with looking at the the commercial implications um, before we get back to some of the regulatory side. Uh, you know, what there's been in the U.S., um, a big uh, shift towards some um, value-based pricing models. Uh, how can real-world evidence uh, help with this and, and really show, um, you, you know, really help price drugs based on their demonstrated value? Right. So, um this is where I think you know it, it's it's uh, it's a bit of a, an art. Um, so, so real world evidence uh, is important to um, to inform value based um, contracting in understanding uh, how are you going to measure you know outcomes in the real world. Um, and so uh, my team does a lot of work with uh, the value based contracting team around. Um, understanding what data is available, what, what can we demonstrate in the real, real world that makes sense? Um, each product is going to have a, each medicine will have a sort of a different endpoint, a, a different uh, set of information that's captured in a real world setting, and then um, and then informing, you know, those negotiations. And, and typically, a, a payer will have their own data as well, right? So they can also check to see does it make sense to to measure, uh, you know, this this outcome measure. Um, can we measure it on our end? Can you guys measure it? And are we agreeing that this is the the right approach for developing a value based contract? Um, so so it, it becomes more of a. It's it. The one thing I'll say is that you know it's 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 less about running trials and studies. It's more about um, having the right data and and being comfortable that you can measure. Um, Something tangible that that you can you know agree is is a measure of uh, the benefit of the medicine, and both parties are very comfortable with that. Um, but certainly, the um, the work that's done in the trials and also in in your traditional real world evidence studies informs informs that value based uh, contracting discussion. I think one place that uh, to really keep an eye on. Um, where real world evidence could could be very important to ultimate pricing is going to be gene therapy, um, with the the one time curative potential, um, having good natural history data to say you know this is why you should pay two million dollars or whatever for a one time thing um, is going to be important not just for uh, regulators. Um, for, for benchmarking for regulators, but also ultimately to uh, support the, the prices, which are going to make a lot of people's stomachs drop when they first hear them. And, and I'll add to that. So in addition to the natural history data, I, I think there's a natural uh, uh, need to collect, follow those patients over time, right? If you're, if you're curing a patient, um, you're going to have to demonstrate that that patient is, is cured. You know, you're going to have to follow them for a certain amount of time. To understand that, and so 
and again, we're not we're not directly in this space, but we've we certainly have, have thought about it. Um, you know, are the payments all up front, or are the payments over time, and are you basically collecting real world evidence uh, on that patient for a number of years to demonstrate that the the cure is durable? Great, thank you. Um, I think uh, it's an interesting space to keep watching for for those uh, those angles. Um, you know, trying to get back to uh, maybe some of the regulatory concerns, um, and uh, you know, Ben was talking about following patients. How how is real world evidence uh, changing post market surveillance and your ability to like measure drug impact over time? or look for unexpected effects? Well, so, I would say if you talk about an expected effect, then it's uh, it can be either on the safety side or on the effectiveness side. Uh, so the long-term effects are always challenging to assess because you need to have also the right data source for this or to build a study which will take some time to collect this information. Uh, but that's not uh, that's all, that's possible definitely at least in some European countries you have also the possibility to get access to national registries where all the information is available and then you can track patients almost from birth to death and to get this information uh, along the lives so uh, and that's a way to further assess definitely uh, how your drug is um, used and the impact that it has on some of these specific events. In that case, uh, it's less applicable, I would say, in rare disease, because if you're looking at unexpected effect, except if it's really large, but I would expect this to have been already observed during the clinical development, then it's more something which will be uh, either after long-term use or uh, in uh, uh, some specific subgroups or with uh, not so frequent um, not so frequent to, to occur, so in that case, you will need also quite a large population to assess this for a long time. Uh, in the rare disease space, um, there has been a lot of uh, work by disease, uh, disease advocacy organizations in some cases, um, which actually ties in with FDA's uh, emphasis on patient-focused patient, patient -focused drug development, um, where organizations like um, Cure SMA or the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation are, uh, are starting to, to, to really collect these, these, these very rich data sets um, on, on the natural history of the disease. Um, and uh, in some cases, there have been efforts uh, specifically to make sure that these are widely available um, data sets. Uh, and FDA's uh, recent rare, uh, draft guidance on rare disease development is extremely enthusiastic about um, natural history studies as uh, a, a way to uh, to know the to know the field. Um, and uh, you know, but again, some of these these are long-term projects. Um, but if they are in the public domain, uh, then other people can 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 use them uh, to to guide and inform more efficient uh, drug development and usage. Thanks. I think there is a similar uh, initiative in Europe. Uh, we, uh, the European Medicine Agency has just released uh, a few months before uh, the end of last year a uh, discussion paper on the registries, and there were quite some initiatives and meetings at the European Medicine Agency uh, since 2017 uh, about this specific uh, disease, and specifically, I will say, more rare disease like uh, cystic fibrosis and others, and try to ensure that indeed the registries that are built in different countries can be first sustainable, because that's one of the key topics when we're dealing also with long-term effect. We need to ensure that the source will still be there when the data will be needed. And also maybe to optimize the use of these registries with a kind of standardization of the data which are collected so that we can also pull data from one registry to another. So there were many topics that are uh, indeed uh, as a priority for the, at least in Europe, like I guess for the FDA. Great, thanks. Um, I'll note that we already have a, a bunch of, of great questions in from the audience. So I'm going to start asking some of those. Um, you know, Ben, for you, um, 
other than the open label component of the Salford study, uh, what about the design made it a pragmatic trial? And uh, maybe just yeah. also we've got a couple questions about pragmatic trials. So um, yeah, let me see if I can really cover. how you guys are thinking about those. Yeah, let me see if I can cover a, a couple of these. Um, so um, what made it pragmatic? So the um, basically the the patients were randomized, uh, and then we tried to leave them alone as much as possible. They picked up their, their drug at the pharmacy. There were no planned visits um, and, you know, um, minimal in, interaction with the patient. And so, you know, the, 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 the clinical information systems collected, you know, whatever visits they had, hospitalizations and so forth. Um, I think there was a couple of other ones about pragmatic trial. Is there anything else that I could cover? Uh, oh, so just to be clear, there, there there was a traditional phase three trial running for the for the product. So you know we're going to show efficacy and safety in a traditional RCT. This was um, a study to demonstrate the benefit in a real world setting. So and that's always going to be the case. I think you know these. These uh, real world evidence studies are always going to be complementary to a clinical trial, um, and you know maybe in the future they will replace certain cl clinical trials, but it's still it's still not clear you know what types of clinical trials that would replace. Um, and then and then this question about um, maybe related to this cost and, and financial upside, um, I would say that you know the expectation is that we should be able to save money. In running these studies because we should minimize data collection because the data exists or is being collected through the healthcare system that's still not there yet but I think you know as we as we move forward and we're able to run studies that are yeah. um, using using data that's uh, you know observational in nature it's, it's it's the data has been collected retrospective and it's robust then there's a lot of savings both with cost of running studies and with time if you can quickly do an analysis in six months instead of two or three years, that, that saves a lot, for, you know, there's a lot there in terms of impact. If I may add to this, I think that one of the key criteria also there to be accepted uh, as a, uh, a, a real evidence will definitely be linked to the quality of the data, which is also in this area of real-world data a key topic, uh, at least for regulators in both sides of the um, Atlantic Ocean, I would say, and it's very challenging because in real life, indeed, most of the sources that we are using, uh, which are either claims databases or EMR databases or registries, disease or product registries, are most often not uh, built for the purpose of your research questions. So it may be good that address it for some questions, but may be bad for others. So you definitely need to assess the quality of the data, and if you need to ensure that this quality is high enough to provide the robust evidence, it has also a cost uh, because you may need some validation studies before or additional data collection to complement uh, the secondary use of data. So it's also something that you need to consider because cost is a one point, but also as Ben said, the time is also another one. Thanks. Let me. Um Leave us with one more question, uh, and um, I'll remind people we'll, we'll follow up on, on questions we haven't gotten to, but it's been uh, a, a lively discussion. We appreciate everyone's attention. Um, so let's leave it with, uh, how did you, Ben and Patrice, um, how did you overcome the challenges of convincing your colleagues, regulatory in particular, to take what would have been perceived as risks at the time? So, um, so we just went through this recently, and it starts with um, what challenge are you addressing? You know, external challenge. Uh, we need evidence to demonstrate, you know, a result to payers, and our clinical trials aren't sufficient. Um, and again, getting back to my point around how big of a decision is it? Do we need a pragmatic clinical trial or a prospective study? Um, and so you, you, it does take a lot of work. Uh, you don't start with regulatory, by the way. You start with, uh, you know, the needs of, of that medicine. Typically, you're, you're dealing with the commercial um, medical leads, and then you're building the case, and then um, you're, you're also bringing along regulatory as well. 
in terms of why that this study is going to answer that, the appropriate question. Yeah, I, I think it always starts with what's the strategic need and if it will fit with indeed what you, you need to have in order to have your product approved and bringing the right evidence on the table coming either from the clinical trial or the real life. Uh, I will say uh, I have also the chance to have colleagues within my company, specifically in regulatory affairs, which are very focused on this topic and uh, willing to learn about to use also real world data during the development. So that's one chance because then it's easy to convince that it may be the right option, but it's sometimes also a bit more challenging to, to try the opposite, to say that no, for this specific example, this is not the right one. Uh, so we should do it more traditionally there. But it's a team decision anyway, and it should fit with the overall strategy for the product in terms of development. And from a regulatory standpoint, FDA has, has said time and time again, um, come talk to them. They are interested in creative approaches, and they want to know early, and they want to contribute. And that's definitely Great. key, Eric. Because it's easy to come to, to there and have this open discussion with them and you see also how open they are to some of the design that you can propose and really adapt according to their feedback. So that's key indeed. Terrific. Um, well, thanks uh, to our panel so much for sharing their insights. Um, thanks to everyone for listening and uh, for any questions that we didn't get to, we will try and follow up on those. Uh, I think it's clearly a, a very uh, a topic people are quite keen on, on knowing more about. Um, so I'll, I'd say, you know, certainly both Pink Sheet, Script, and Enviva will all continue to be following this closely. Um, I'd also like to flag that Informa is planning another webinar soon on real world evidence, so keep an eye out for information on that. Um, once again, a recording of the webinar and PDF of the slides will be sent as soon as it's available. If you have any other questions or comments, please email them to pharma at informa.com. Thank you all again, and have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Bye.